Hi everybody, welcome back. This is going to be a slightly different um, video than the things that we normally do on this channel. My name is Ollie, I'm a junior doctor living and working in the northeast of England and I'm joined by a very special guest. Hi, uh, I'm Aqua and I'm a final year medical student at Leicester. So we put up a story a very long time ago now about dating in medicine and relationships in medicine in medical school and beyond medical school and it's a very different scene right i think that the trials and tribulations of dating and relationships and things like that medicine puts quite a, a different spin on on that whole state of affairs i think today we're we're going to try and answer some of the questions that you guys submitted on your story something that i want to address first just because i'm slightly annoyed by it is on camera it doesn't look like there is any height difference between us in reality, there is a very significant height difference. Aqua's really short. I'm not. You are how tall? Five foot two and a half. The half is important. It's very important. Clearly. I'm five foot ten and a bit. <laughs> he's, he's five foot ten and a half. Exactly. So the halves cancel. I'm just saying, in reality, there is a much bigger height difference than how it appears. How did you get into a relationship? Ollie and I were super interested in medical education and that's why both him and I signed up to be interns um, with ASME and I'm sure you've seen it featured on Ollie's like Instagram and he's mentioned it before and he's also mentioned um, you know a paper that we wrote together um, and I guess friendship became banter and then banter <laughs> became a flirtationship and then he asked me out yeah yeah it was very I want to say organic yeah, in was. a weird way because um, I don't think that any of us, that any of us, there are only two of us, that either of us was necessarily looking for something. No. It, it's not like, um, I don't know, Tinder or Hinge or, or anything equivalent like that where, where you sort of go out of your way looking for somebody to form a relationship yeah. with. This was just one of those very... Um, you know, this person seems cool. Um, it's presumably what Aqua thought when she met me. And then now here we are. What, a year and a bit yeah, later? I'd say that. Um, and like, it's quite nice because um, we have so many common interests and we like the same things. Um, it's just, we get on. I mean, I'm sure that we might talk more about this in the answers to future questions that are more questions in the video. But because our interests are similar enough like the idea that we both want to be surgeons for example there are things that we can do to improve both of our portfolios and things at the same time without competing with one another yeah. because the specialties and the things that the two of us are interested in our pathways don't cross at all so there are never going to be situations in which I'm competing for things that Aqua also wants or Aqua's going to outdo me on things that I want because our training pathways are different. But I have. But she has. Paul Morg has asked, did you have any strains on your your relationship with the long distance? Yeah, me. I wouldn't have necessarily said that the distance itself is the strain, mm. if that makes sense, um, because the, you know the UK is not that big um you, you can you can feasibly get to almost wherever you want within a few hours I think more what's been difficult is making the timetables work and the rotors work now that certainly I'm I mean when we got together we were both students um and medical students have very unpredictable and busy and weird um timetables that doesn't change when you graduate and you become a doctor um so now that i'm working i suppose my time is at least more predictable because you have a rotor, it's fixed yeah my rotor is in theory fixed and i know when i'm going to be at work the problem is still kind of the nhs in a sense like even though i have a fixed set of hours it's very often that I have to swap shifts, or I have to cover for other people, mm -hmm. or I have to stay late, or, or a juicy locum. Yeah, or there's a you know a locum that comes up. Like your time, even though you 
in theory have a rotor and in theory your hours are fixed the real world doesn't really work like that if there is going to be a strain it's from that because it just limits the time when we can actually see each other even yeah you know no it's frustrating because like ollie needs to book so much in advance now um for any i guess plans that we could possibly think of yeah um and when i start working it's probably going to get possibly worse yeah again for those of you that don't know like You are entitled to a certain amount of annual leave as a junior doctor but the problem with that again is that you you invariably do not get your rota with much forewarning at all so i've just got my rota for my next rotation about three and a bit weeks before i'm due to start when contractually i'm supposed to have it six weeks before but even then, because you don't know what your rotor is going to be, it often makes planning any further ahead than two or three months. Mm-hmm. It makes it virtually impossible. It relies on so many things falling into place that you have no control over. And even then, you can be denied that, that like, particular request. day or whatever. Mm-hmm. So actually getting the time off to do particular things that you might want to do, mm-hmm. especially on short notice, is next to impossible we have a lot of things that we need to do Mm. you know things like writing papers going on courses going to conferences um projects like the works yeah doing additional degrees and all the rest of it like these are things that in order for us to have the careers we want Mm. have to happen like ignoring anything else and i think we very early on had a conversation about you know priority has to be the job to an extent and as long as we're both like mutually happy with the job or you know we want different jobs but the jobs being the priority and everything that we do is secondary to that then it's actually worked out pretty well yeah so maybe building on on that last question somebody's asked what do you both want to do okay um so i am i guess there's no surprise. Um, I'm super, super interested in academic urology. Um, and the reason why is I'm very passionate about men's health. And like, I'm also wary of, I am the type of person to wear my emotions on my sleeves. Um, so I think that's why with academic urology, I, you know, can have short-ish relationships with my patients. You know, do surgery, see them in clinics, but it's not really, really long, long, long term. I don't need to follow them up. However, with the research aspect, I can hopefully create a change and impact on many lives. So that that's how I'm kind of fulfilling both of my passions in in the future. And I want to be a surgeon too. Um, I like I I really want that. And Ollie talks about what he wants to do. Um, I think me wanting to be an academic urology like specialist I guess can give me that flexibility that we may need in the future yeah you you know you've got to think about I mean you shouldn't have to think about I think it's a very great shame but I think if if you're going into a relationship as a as a medic couple and not not just medics but this is going to be true of medics and allied health professionals as well if you're potentially settling in for something longer term or you want a bit more stability or flexibility down the line as aqua says certain specialties and types of role are more amenable to that than others so the answer for me at the moment is that i want to do neurosurgery um that is um neurological surgery brain and spine has a reputation that i'm sure it very well deserves for being basically life ruining hellscape of a training program and is very well known for being non-flexible um you know you live at the hospital the job is your life is what most registrars and consultants tell me about neurosurgery training either either you're going to have a partner that matches that in which case you'll just never see each other bye yeah or you one of you does something that's known for being like super 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 intense if if we stayed together and and carried on that my training pathway would probably demand more of the both of us than your training pathway for example just because of how how the training is 
um, for example, I'm much more likely to have to move for jobs than than Acra is because urology has massive demand yeah. for services, whereas neurosurgery is very centre specific and there are not many jobs, mm -hmm. so you you have to be willing to move around. Yeah. So it's just considering those sorts of elements. Murray Sherry, ninety five. Any top tips for non-medic stating medics? Well, as a non-medic myself. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tips for non-medic stating medics. So that's that's what I would want somebody who was... If I was going out with somebody who wasn't a doctor, what I would want them to know. Well, you're not a doctor. True. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm not, not. Not yet. Um, but she's just finished her finals. Literally, what, yesterday, day before. Day before. <laughs> um, Hopefully I pass. Um, tips for non-medic stating medics. I think, I don't want to frame this answer in a way that sounds like elitist or, or um, paternalistic or whatever. I think it is recognising or trying to recognise that the stresses that come in healthcare are very particular compared to most normal industries, right? And not just doctors, but healthcare staff go to work and routinely see horrible, like horrible, traumatic, upsetting things that that most people thankfully will never see or never never have to deal with. And so that's that's one element of it. Um and and we tend to see everything in quite a depersonalized way, right? It's it's a you disassociate it from. Yeah, you you have to do a certain amount of of barricading yourself mm. away from that stuff so it doesn't affect you, mm. but but you do still see it. So that there's that. Then I think there's the NHS itself is a very weird place to work, because it is kind of like a very dysfunctional, crumbling system that is kind of crawling along and is only kept going by the people that work within it going above and beyond what should actually be yeah. required. Yeah. So kind of everyone's putting in like 110% all the time and that's not a normal environment, I don't think. So there's, there's kind of that. Yeah. You feel like you're sort of bashing your head against a brick wall most of the time. And again, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen elsewhere, but it happens every day in the NHS. But then thirdly, what is perhaps different about dating a, a doctor or being in a relationship with a doctor is that on top of the NHS being a very weird place to work and the horrible things that you're seeing day to day today, doctors are actually making clinical decisions within that setting and they their career often lives or dies by those decisions and their patients live or die by by their decisions even from when you're very junior before before I go on you know with my with my answer to this too much longer I think that is all I would ask people to remember about their their partners if you are seeing a doctor is that huge parts of our lives aren't in our control to start with, like even though we wish they were, they're just not. Our training requirements and all of the portfolio and the politics and all of that is ridiculous. And again, most industries, you don't have to deal with things like that. And then on top of that, you're going to work every day and you're having to make quite highly consequential decisions, even for somebody who is very young. If your doctor partner ever feels a bit distant or disinterested or too tired or they're repeatedly failing to make, meet you for dates or not home on time. The vast, vast majority of the time, it's not within their control. So I think it's just being understanding of all of these things. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? No, literally that. Um, and I think you're wrong in the sense that it obviously it can happen in other fields like law. There are some other really demanding yeah. um, things where they can, you know, kind of relate to doctors. Um, I think what I would call high performance industry yeah, exactly. right where I you are yeah. yeah that's very fair it's a setting where where you are required to perform at a high level at all times and if you don't there will be consequences yeah that's better that's better yeah, yeah. all the high performing but I think just literally understanding each other and um, making time for each other like in some shape or form 
How do you make time for each other when your rotors are literally opposite? I think I'm just like, so, this is happening. Ollie, you free this weekend? Or are you free X, Y, Z? And I ask him like, in two months in advance, three months in advance, who knows? Will I ever see you? Don't know. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trying and failing. Oh, 100%. But that's why, like, I'm really grateful that, like, I'm a bit of background. I'm usually online, like, I'm, like, I'm used to the whole online scene and I live on Discord and stuff. So, um, I guess to me, because prior to Ollie and I, I was in predominantly long distance relationships. Um, like prior to him, I went out with someone in the US. So making time for each other doesn't necessarily have to mean we're meeting face to face. Because there's a lot of stuff where I need Ollie's input for all of the other co-curricular stuff that we do. Um, and that's literally just either a, a call or a Zoom or Discord, you know? Like that's how we spend time with each other as well. Yeah, it's, it's often like, with us two, it's often like work stuff. Yeah. Being in a relationship doesn't necessarily mean you have to be face to face. I don't think. Yeah, um, you know, for all for all, I hate being on Zoom and Teams and things all day and Discord. It is actually a blessing yeah. in some settings. I think so. So j- just actually on the topic of distance and um, making time for each other and, and jobs and all of that. Um, you know, this is something that's happening in real time right now because I'm we're in Newcastle right now filming this. Um, but Aqua's just got her job, so she's got an academic job like mine. So huge congratulations! Um, and you're going to be down in London um, in the south for two years and completely, yeah, opposite ends. And I just checked um, on you know train line, six hours. Nice. <laughs> yeah. But but this is this is coming back to that same that same idea of we're so early early careers and the decisions that we're making the decisions that we're making at this stage have the potential to affect the rest of our careers essentially um, because of the pathways that we want to be on you you almost have a, a limited time window in which to get all of this groundwork done so for me I really wanted this academic job up here in Newcastle which I got um, this is obviously while I was still a student but then the time has to come and the time has come and is here where Aqua has to decide what she wants from a job and what is going to be important for her career mm. and that for you is in the south is down there yeah we're mutually lucky I think or I feel lucky that I have a partner who understands that I need a particular set of career and geographical things and Aqua needs the same mm-hmm. and I think because we have that mutual understanding it it yes, actually it yeah work and I think what's quite important as well is that I think both you and I we've we kind of made these decisions prior to meeting each other yeah and I think that's key like we didn't pair our athlete, like none, none of that stuff no and that, that's not a bad so for, for those that don't know and I'm going to brush through this very quickly if you for example have a, a partner or a family or whatever there are many reasons you can actually be pre-allocated for your jobs as a junior doctor to a particular region so if you've got kids in school or you've got a long-term partner who, well, you, you're a carer. Yeah, yeah, you've got some reason that you need to be in a particular place. You can either be pre-allocated or you can, if if we were, say, both in final year at the same time. Now, I'm a, a year ahead of Aqua in terms of careers, if you like. So we're the same. Well, you're older than me. Yes, I'm by, older by four months. Yeah, but Aqua's like the year below me in medical school, if that makes sense. I um, didn't fail. He just went on the grad course, and I went on the yeah, normal. Yeah, so I'm d- I did a four-year program. I was doing a five-year. Um, but if we were in final year at the same time, we could have linked our applications. And what that does is it ties you together for the purposes of being allocated jobs. Um, now that can be a bit of a double-edged sword because, say, 
Aqua had got a very high application score and I'd gotten a very low score, I would drag us down because they go by the lowest score. Mm-hmm. If we both scored high, that I mean, we actually would have done, looking at our respective scores, we would have scored quite well mutually. But if I'd have had a bad day and really bombed the SJT, the situational judgment test, mm-hmm. I then drag Aqua down with me and we potentially end up somewhere that we don't want to be. Yeah. So it's... It can work well and has worked well for many people, but it can bite you a little bit. Is the Warwick curse real? <laughs> so the Warwick curse, um, what this refers to is Warwick Medical School. is It's one of the only graduate entry exclusive medical schools in the UK, and that's where I did medical school. Um, it's known for being a very intense course, especially the first year of the program is like, life ruining i was so miserable um you still are. i'm still miserable but i'm less miserable than when i was doing that year um what the warwick curse refers to is that because people are usually a bit older when they come to medical school usually mid-20s to to 30s um many people come to med school already in kind of established relationships they might be married they might have been you know cohabiting They're in fairly serious relationships. And I think what the Warwick curse basically refers to is if you come to medical school, if you come to Warwick already in a long-term relationship, the odds of that long-term relationship surviving your time at Warwick are not very good. I I don't necessarily think it's more true of Warwick than anywhere else. I think medical school probably in general is a place where long-term relationships break down. Mm. Just like university. It's just stress. Yeah. You're very stressed. You're being put into an environment with, especially at medical school and grad entry medical school, where you're among a set of very like-minded new people a lot of whom will be very attractive. <laughs> like, Temptation Island. Yeah, to you. Um, it's kind of... And your mindset is so rapidly changing yeah. as well. You, you grow as a person so much. Yeah, not and not just university. Like, we've both been through university twice. Yeah. Like, university will do that to you. Um, if you go to university in a relationship, I, by and large, would advise people that it's probably not going to survive and that's not necessarily a bad thing but yeah no, not, not always the case not always but but often it can happen yeah. yeah and that i think it's just because people change you yeah. you change so much and the same is true of medical school yeah. that you change so much yeah. through the course so do i think it's necessarily worse at warwick than anywhere else probably not no but it's it's real yeah it's real <laughs> but i think as i said um, I think Ollie and I were quite lucky in the sense that we both met each other at the same time that we did, you know? Like, and quite far into medical school yeah. as well. Decisions already made and all of that. It just now we're just, I guess, putting the jigsaw piece in yeah. place. That's it. Okay, everybody, so that's where we're actually going to wrap this up before this gets crazy, crazy long. Thank you so much for watching. This has been... Well, this is actually the second time that we've recorded this. Um, we were away in Belfast a few months ago yeah. um, to attend, again, to attend a conference. On medical education, wow. Y- yeah, um, together, uh, at which we both spoke <laughs> in the end. Um, so we went, had a nice time in Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, and um, we tried to record this video then, and it just it just didn't work the video and the audio quality was all over the place and no good so i thought while aqua is here uh, visiting me in newcastle it would be the right time to try and film it again and hopefully all the sound and everything plays ball this time so that's where we'll leave it if you've got any questions that we haven't addressed in this video and we tried to slim it down a bit so there are probably many um but please drop a comment um we'll try and answer as many as we as can. quickly as we can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye. Bye.